in the afternoon, we have another lecture. Uh, hopefully, we can start in the afternoon at 2 p.m. Okay. In the morning, I'm going to talk about magnetic susceptibility. Yesterday, I mentioned already to you uh, two techniques to measure uh, magnetic properties. One was the VSM system, which was uh, designed and developed by Simon Foner in the 50s. And the other one was uh, a balance, Faraday balance. There is also another configuration of measuring magnetic properties using the weight or change in the weight. Typical standard is called Gi balance. They operate about the same way, actually. So I will touch a little bit on this issue. And this is the agenda for this morning with you. And that is the typical arrangement that I showed you yesterday uh, how to measure magnetic properties. So this draw actually is a little bit off of reality because uh, in all these uh, balance techniques to measure, you are measuring some force. And then your sample needs to be in a region where there is gradient of magnetic field. And if you look at the draw, the poles here are flat. <laughs> flat poles give you uniform magnetic field. So it's a mistake in this draw. But you know, maybe it is size this point to you. But you can see the sample is right there. And the sample is connected to a scale or a balance, whatever the word you like better. Uh, and then uh, when you increase, when you apply the external field, and you increase the field, so there is a force in the sample if the sample is magnetic. And that force can, measure, can be measured by the balance. So you can scale and calibrate your system. You can use some standard and calibrate your system. And at the end, the number you have in the dial of the scale is proportional to the magnetization of your sample. Okay. Once you have the magnetization, you can have the are connected. So let's say actually you are measuring force. And in the Gi balance uh, uh, configuration, you are measuring this force. If you look at this, those vectors, See, this is, uh, this is magnetization in terms of volume, and this is magnetization in terms of mass. You can express uh, the way it is more convenient to you. If you are using, let's say, sample, liquid sample, hmm, maybe you better express in terms of volume. If you are measuring solid samples, maybe you better express in terms of mass. But if you express it in terms of volume in a liquid sample, you have to remind if you are doing the experiment, let's say take hours to do your experiment, your liquid, liquid sample may be the solvent can evaporate and then change the volume, right? So the sample holder, in this case, needs to be properly designed to avoid evaporation of the liquid, of the solvent. That's, you know, some careful you should take. But anyway, this is the standard way to write the vectors. And then you can take the gradient there and make this dot product. So at the end, you have all these equations, but the one which is more interesting is this one. So, you see 
Let's get back there. Uh, in this configuration, this is the Z axis. Okay? That's the Z axis. So it's the axis along which the force is applied. Okay? So what, what is interesting to us in all those equations is the force along the Z axis. Hmm? That, that is the one you have to pick up to scale with the magnetization measurements only. Okay? Now, <coughs> uh, okay. Typical data you can extract from this measurement. You can see in the case of gadolinium. And remember yesterday I showed you a one plot that uh, showed uh, magnetization of three transition, actually two transition metal ions and one ray earth, which was gadolinium. It was gadolinium, iron, and chromium. All of them follow the Brillouin function very nice. Okay, so because they were, as I mentioned to you, they were. Uh, ions in solution. So ions in solution, no matter how high the you know the spin number is, they will not be ordered at long distance. It's moving, so they are paramagnetic. Okay. Now here is gadolinium again, <coughs> and you can see uh, this. This is the inverse of susceptibility versus temperature. It's key he law. You know, it follows the key he law. And oh no, I'm sorry. This is not gadolinium solution. This is a solid. You can see this is a key he vice law. You can see the straight line doesn't cross zero. Okay. So it follows actually. The key he buys law. So the susceptibility here is something like this. This is key he buys. And you can see it follows pretty much well. Huh? Experimental data can fit on that expression. And you can find, of course, you know, this theta temperature. So this is the way to measure it a little bit more in detail. And then what you want is exactly the force along the z-axis. So the force along the z-axis goes like this one. And then you can extract the susceptibility here. So, uh, of course, you need to calibrate. Calibration, usually, you can use, for instance, uh, tantalum to calibrate the system is another calibration uh, material. Besides, nickel is strong, nickel metal is too strong to calibrate susceptibility. It is good to calibrate magnetization. But it is too strong, actually. So another material which is very useful to calibrate susceptibility, especially if you take from paramagnetic materials or uh, weak ferromagnetic materials, is copper sulfate. Water solution of copper sulfate is a very good standard. Mm -hmm. So we have two standards, actually strongly magnetic, which is nickel, and the other one which is very stable paramagnetic, which is copper sulfate solution. It's easy to prepare, but again, you have to be careful when handling this liquid, put it in your system. You have to seal properly the sample holder to avoid water to evaporate, and then change you know, the magnetic properties of this one. Okay, now, 
uh, the system I showed you before is susceptibility we call DC susceptibility. Okay, so the applied field is a DC field. Hmm? Now, besides DC susceptibility, you can also explore how the magnetic system responds to AC field, which is AC susceptibility. It gives you different information system. It tells you how quickly the magnetic system responds to the AC applied field. Uh, you know, it provides you different information. It provides information about the relaxation of the system, the magnetic relaxation of the system. And of course, there are also many different proposals in terms of instrument to measure AC susceptibility. One of them, which is very interesting because you can play between AC susceptibility and magnetic resonance, especially nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, as I mentioned to you yesterday, the magnetic moment associated to nuclear particles is very small. The bore, the nuclear bore magneton, is about 2,000 times smaller than the electron bore magneton. Because in the ball magneton mass is uh, on on you know on the lower side of the fraction, not on the upper side, and because you know uh, nuclear particles like neutrons and 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 um, protons they have mass about one thousand three. Uh, bigger than the mass of electrons. So if it goes on the lower side of your fraction, it makes the Bohr magneton almost 2,000 times smaller. So the magnetic moment associated to the nuclear particles are very, very small. And then, of course, it requires sensible to measure them. And this one, developed by Robinson, in Oxford, this man was a tech. Uh, he worked for many years in 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 Oxford, in the Clarendon lab, actually, and he worked for important guys, the guys who discovered uh, the uh, electron paramagnetic resonance. Uh, I like Professor Blini. So he was a technician of Professor Blini, actually. Uh, so Hobbeson visited us in, in Brazil a few times. So he was in the Clarendon lab in Oxford. So he proposed a system to measure uh, susceptibility, AC susceptibility. The system is very simple. So we made this uh, many times in, in, in my lab in Brazil. So, actually, you have to make a coil around your sample holder, right? You do by yourself. Huh? Uh, I have two PhD students, with, they work with this technique there. So, you take your sample, you just make a coil around the sample and plug. This, this is not a problem. And you, you don't need to be very careful to make this coil, actually. This technique is in the oscillator. The Robinson oscillator here is the key point. It's a very fine electronics, actually. And Robinson, he himself uh, optimized this Robinson oscillator for about 20 years. As the electronics available uh, moves ahead, he used to revise his Robinson oscillator, improving it more and more. Unfortunately, he was too old to keep improving for 100 years more. And, OK, but this is the Robinson oscillator. You can use it to make NMR measurements of uh, different isotopes. Uh, 
uh, like ray earth isotopes, actually. It was developed to be sensitive to ray earth isotopes, like gadolinium, yeah? erupting all these ions. And, but to understand this, this is the, you know, this is the size where you put your sample inside and make your coil around it. Okay, at the end, you just plug this sample holder to the Robinson oscillator and put the sample inside the magnet. Okay, so uh, DC field applied externally because the AC field is applied in the coil. You round, uh, you wind it around your sample. Okay, now <coughs> you can write the, the susceptibility you know, uh, dynamical susceptibility in the standard way. So the real and imaginary components of it, and then you have the real and imaginary components of it. And then you can measure both components in terms of a voltage difference, actually. Or you can measure in terms of frequency difference. So this is, we have uh, precise instruments today to measure voltage. And you have very precise instruments to measure frequency. It's not a problem. So the shift in voltage and the shift in frequency, as you change the value of the external field, or as you change the value of the frequency of the oscillator, once you make your coil, you cannot move the frequency very much. The, you know, every coil you make, it operates in a narrow range, okay? If you want to work in a different range, different range, you have to make a different coil, more turns, or, you know, the, 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 the thickness of your wire, so you have to play with this, actually. You play according to the range you want to measure the susceptibility, okay? Now, it's easy to measure the real and imaginary component, precisely. And you can explore how the real and imaginary component can follow the applied external field. Of course, you can insert your sample inside a cryostat and make it at different temperature too. So there is no problem to insert it there. It's easy. And you can make a closed cryostat because, see, your sample is connected to the Robbins oscillator by wiring. So, no problem. Okay? You have, you know, the, the feed through of this cryostat and then you can work easily with any kind of cryostat. There is no limitation in this case. Sometimes, you know, techniques are difficult to measure as a function of temperature because the system you cannot insert in a cryostat. I will show one of this this afternoon about Mossbauer spectroscopy. It's a, unfortunately, it's a big limitation for that one. Okay, now you can explore different systems. Hmm? Especially interesting are paramagnetic systems and superparamagnetic systems and explore magnetism where the system is just in a point that a paramagnetic system can move and shift to ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic just at that transition this is a good point about this system so <clears throat> in this case what we did, this is a work we did in our group in Brazil. So we synthesize uh, tin oxide, actually. So tin oxide is a semiconductor. Huh? You can easily synthesize using different chemical routes. You can easily synthesize uh, tin oxide as nanoparticles. And these days, people are using very much tin oxide as sensors, gas, especially gas sensors. Very useful, very useful for gas sensors. But 
in order to modulate the sensor, you might play with you know, some approach. You might play with the size of the nanoparticle. You might play with the, with the uh, shape of the nanoparticles, because you can synthesize spherical ones. You can synthesize also some wires, thin oxide wires. So they are different, different shape, different properties. And then you can dope them, especially doping. You can dope with transition metal ions. And you can change a lot the properties of this one. In this case, what we did, we dope with chromium. So chromium-3. Remember here, thing is the valence is 4 plus, and chromium was 3 plus. And then, if chromium enters the crystal structure of the thin oxide, it is a doping that generates defects. Sure, because, you know, they have different valency. And when you dope it in a, in, in, in a range like this one, it's about, it's almost, the, the, you know, the, the higher end is almost 20%. But this huh? when you do doping, the amount of the doping species you put, you try to make, it doesn't mean it goes on the crystal structure, because there is a limit of solubility. So maybe you try to make a dope with 20%, but your system only allows maximum of 9.1. Okay? But this is normal. So, we did the synthesis of uh, those uh, T oxide nanoparticles. You can see here uh, the TM. In the high resolution, we can identify the planes and say, okay, the sample we synthesized is exactly T oxide. It's very important to stay to make this sort of characterization. Uh, you can do it with high resolution. And you can also make your particle size distribution. This one, the average was about 9 nanometers. And you can check how wide the particle size distribution is. You want to make it as narrow as possible, OK? Because then you want to use this in a sensor. And the sensor responds in a very precise, uh, makes, gives you back a very precise response. If, if, if not a particle is a wide distribution, then you have a wide response. So we don't want that. But in this case, uh, you can see here uh, the magnetization as a function of the field. And then, you can see that the curves at lower doping, they follow more or less the Brillouin function. But as the doping goes higher and higher, like this one here, you can see the, the symbols are experimental and, and the solid line is the fitting. It deviates hmm? because it is not paramagnetic at all. Because as you increase, as you increase the concentration of chromium, at some point chromium and chromium starts to interact. So the maybe clusters of chromium, you can form clusters of chromium, and those clusters are not paramagnetic anymore. Okay, they might be, for instance, antiferromagnetic, hmm? because chromium oxide. Uh, Cr2O3 chromium oxide is antiferromagnetic. And maybe if you force the system to accept a higher concentration of chromium doping, the system doesn't like it. What, it, what happens usually is phase separation. So you have another phase in your system. And that what happened in this case, actually. At the end, we found this. So, uh, the thin oxide nanoparticles, they don't accept that much higher doping. And then chromium, the excess of chromium, just locate at the shell. And that shell has a higher concentration of chromium. 
one phase of chromium oxide, which is antiferromagnetic. And then that's why, you know, this curve deviates from the Brillouin function. Okay. This is good and bad. Hmm? It is good because now, for those people who like to make models, huh, play with this and say, okay, now I want to understand the mag magnetism of this core shell system, where the core is really paramagnetic, and the shell is antiferromagnetic. So is a combination of these two phases until data. The points are the data. So you can play your you can play your model with these two phases, this core shell structure. And then okay, just fit your data in your model. See how good that goes. Huh? You keep working. No so people love to do this, right? Okay, so this is a very uh, you can explore the system in many directions, huh? actually. And besides, remember, between the core and the shell, there is the interface. And this interface plays, usually plays, a very key role in the, uh, in the final properties of the system. And as you change the temperature, see, this interface may be that is a constant, it's not the same. And then they have a lattice mismatch, which generates strain and stress. And that changes the properties. So remember, the core tin oxide is a semiconductor. And if you apply some strain in any semiconductor, especially nano sized, you change the band gap. Okay, now so you can play with the system in many many ways. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's the system you can see here. Another way to plot. Now we are plotting here inverse of susceptibility versus T. We expect to follow a Kihi bias, Kihi or Kihi bias law. But when you try to make this as a uh, key revise, we just add an extra term here hmm? to make fitting better. Try to fit and try to extract the information from this one. But you can see the fitting is not really, you know, the fitting is not really good. Huh? Uh, so you can see, for instance, uh, you might take, you know, the, the, the constant you get from the lower doping, you don't expect it changes, right? So that constant is not changing. And then you use the same constant to try to fit the higher concentrated samples. It doesn't perfectly. So it is, again, an indication that the system might develop to a core shell. And the core is a phase, it's a different phase likely chromium oxide. So that was the you know, end conclusion of this work. OK, here is another way to another system, very interesting. It's another interesting oxide, also semiconductor, Syria, cerium oxide. Hmm? Again, Syria, cerium here is cerium 4. That's the uh, valence of cerium. Cerium oxide, CeO2, we call ceria. And then we dope it with iron in this range. And the ceria, the average size is about 6 nanometer. So small particles, and then we make a doping with iron and try to explore the system the same way. And we found that as we increase the doping content, you can see here, the size of the nanoparticle just dropped down. Hmm? So there is a 
we keep the same protocol in the synthesis. Everything the same. We just change the, the, you know, the doping content. And what happens is that we found we can modulate the size just changing the doping content. But again, that is not the only doping. Also, the properties change, of course. And again, we found that despite we push the system up to 10%, 10 mole percent, the iron doesn't enter there, right? So, this is a problem in the synthesis because it doesn't depend on uh, very much on the synthesis protocol. It depends on how much the lattice can absorb a foreign ion. Okay, so we, we can identify, can take the X-ray diffraction and we can identify, you know, the typical lines of Syria is there. Hmm? They change, of course, they change uh, uh, the full width at half height, they change a little bit peak position because as you include doping, remember, you are doping the system with a foreign ion. And then you might have contraction, a little bit contraction of the latency. Or if the IO is bigger than the side, you have expansion of the latency. And so the X-ray peak position is very sensitive to this expansion and contraction. Okay? So, but typically, typically, uh, all these peak positions are typical of Syria. You can take those data and, and analyze them, you know, more precisely. You can perform some rich belt refinement, and then you can extract more information from this one, which is nice, and then, and, and, which is software for rich belt refinement is free. There are many. Mm, you can just go and download and try one, try another one, see which one you like better. Okay, now we can see the data. Look, the same sample, and <coughs> we can uh, we measure the susceptibility as a function of T. And then you can see typical key revised behavior, very typical. But if you measure the magnetization, Look at that. Look what is the measurement you take exactly. It's like this. So you have a very strong negative slope. And yesterday I mentioned to you when you try to fit magnetization, uh, you might have in your system a, a paramagnetic contribution, but also might have a diamagnetic contribution. So if you look at diamagnetism, how diamagnetism goes with the magnetization of diamagnetic material as a function of, of that's as a function of H, so the diamagnetism goes like this, actually. This is the dia. And the paramagnetism goes like this. So when you are measuring when you are fitting your data, your magnet, magnetization data, you might add, I wrote like this, plus uh, you know, another magnetization here. This, is, this can fit paramagnetism or diamagnetism. So the slope could be positive or negative. Okay? In this case, the slope is negative. This case is positive. So we found in this sample there is a huge diamagnetic contribution. This is why the measurement looks like that one. Okay? Is the diamagnetism of the template, and the template here is Syria. Hmm? Cerium oxide actually is diamagnetic. 
And the diamagnetism, the strong diamagnetism here comes from the cerium. And the paramagnetism, when you extract the diamagnetism, you have this paramagnetic component. So the paramagnetic component is due to the iron, which is on the crystal structure. So this sample, at the end, it has two contributions to the magnetism. One is paramagnetic for the ions, the doping ions, and the other one is diamagnetic for the cilia, the template, the hosting crystal structure. Hmm? So we can find this, we can try to extract, but if you look, a very interesting point here, this typical temperature here, theta, if the system is perfectly paramagnetic, then this value is zero. But if you see the table here, it's not zero. It's near zero, the theta. So theta comes from minus 0 0.7, 1.3, minus 1.7, minus 1.9, minus 2.2, minus 3.1. It's not really zero, but it is close to what that means. Again, it might be a component of this segregation in the system, like the other system I showed you. So phase segregation, when you try to dope systems like this, especially metal oxide, is very typical. In many cases, this phase segregation just makes some clusters. If you are not too high in doping, maybe the amount of this extra phase is not enough to cover and make a shell, but it just makes some clusters near the surface. Why near the surface? Because all the synthesis process, they take place in air atmosphere. And the formation of these side phases, it is very important to be in contact with oxygen. So oxygen is very important in this case. That's why most of these phases just take place at the surface. And also, any segregation is something, is a process that the hosting lattice is just expelling the excess. It's not going to keep those extra phase in the core. Just expel to the surface. Hmm? The surface is complicated already. Let's put more complication over there. I think this is the way Mother Nature just thinks. OK. And yeah, here is, uh, see, in this, in this system, we went up to 10% mole, OK? The, the, you know, the, the highest doping sample is this one. And then you can we check more carefully this sample. So uh, because it was, we expect this sample is the one that presents the highest concentration of the extra phase. And we want to learn a little bit more about this extra phase. So that's why we choose this highest doping sample and analyze it better. It was better analyzed, and it was the smallest one because as we increase the concentration of iron, the size of the nanoparticle, and we made a susceptibility, uh, AC susceptibility measurements. You can see here, we just change the frequency and sweep the temperature. Typical AC susceptibility. Very typical. In this case, we change the frequency of operation from hertz to almost uh, from about 100 hertz to close to 10,000 hertz. 
hmm, in this range. This is typical. So people do this typically. Commercial system provides you to do this very easily. You can go higher than 10,000, 10 kilohertz, but you can go up to 100 kilohertz, actually. But your system is a little bit special. When you go to 100 kilohertz, not very easy. And also, as you increase the frequency, you can see, typically, the signal goes down, drops down. Hmm? Because it picks up, it picks up uh, the, the, the uh, magnetic system that responds to that very high frequency. And as you see, not all the follow the AC field. So the fraction all the AC field drops down as you increase the frequency. That's why the signal just drops down. So if I go uh, 10 times more than this one, which is 10 kilohertz, if I go 100 kilohertz, uh, the signal really drops down. So your system needs to have a sensor that is very sensitive to pick up this thing. And also, at higher frequency, the signal is very noisy, difficult to analyze. Okay. But anyway, and then this is a typical scaling law that people use for spin glass you know, a spin glass magnetic system is a very special kind of magnetic. In normal, in normal, like ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, or ferrimagnetic. So the spins are located in, a, let's say, a very nice crystal lattice. But if, for some reason, the crystal lattice is not very much crystallized, and the spins are located there. Hmm? So, the spins cannot interact perfectly to one another in a long range, though the system is still magnetic, presents magnetism, but is a very special magnetism. The spins are not aligned perfectly in one direction. They tilt a little bit as you move from one side to the other one. So it makes this a system which doesn't have a perfect long range order. We call this system spin glass system. Hmm? So we want to explore in this sample whether the spin glass is something that happened in the sample. Is there any signature of spin glass in the sample or not? That was the that was our our intention to perform this experiment. So and then we use this scale law which is related to the formation of clusters of spin. Hmm? So and this is a typical, that's the uh, uh, typical time. It goes with inverse of the frequency. And those are typical temperature. This is a glass temperature. This is a freezing temperature. So typical temperature related to spin glass systems. So we try to fit the data with uh, uh, this uh, expression. And at the end, Though, you can see the fitting is very good. But it doesn't mean too much. What means is that uh, what, what is the order of the parameters you can extract from this? So we extract the glass temperature around 18K, which is fine. It is in the range. But the exponent here was about 1.5. Typical for the glass is not 1.5, it's 3, around 3. So we found this really smaller than expected. So what was our conclusion at the end? Though the system may present some spin glass behavior, but 
the amount of extra doping of iron was not maybe enough to form island clusters of spin. Maybe we should even more force even more the system maybe go to 15 percent more more percent or 20 more percent be able to synthesize a more uh, a higher number of clusters and then the system might respond as a, a spinless system so all this information you can extract from susceptibility measurements and nanomaterials is, a, you know, it's it's huge. It's a big opportunity to explore all this because you can change, you can play with many parameters, many. Okay, now uh, okay. here was a, a was a different experiment. We took the same samples. And we make annealing of the sample. One sample was not uh, further treated, thermally treated. It was annealed. It was unannealed. The other one we make thermal treatment. We make annealing of that one. So, and then they respond completely different. The one was annealed at 900 C, and the one was prepared using as prepared. So you can see the as prepared sample goes there. That's susceptibility as a function of T. It is, it is expected to follow the key he vice law. Okay? Uh, so this plot is not very good to check key he vice law. You have to make it linearly. And then you can see the change. So instead of plotting susceptibility versus T, you better plot inverse of susceptibility. And you can see the difference here. Mm -hmm. So the one which was not annealed, it follows pretty much key vice law. Though, though you can see it crosses, it crosses the temperature axis in the negative, which is a signature of antiferromagnetism. Mm -hmm. Theta negative, and it is minus about minus twelve k. So, we already uh, made hypothesis not only one phase, it was phase separation. It was formation of, of some uh, glass clusters, okay? And that glass clusters, that is responding for those uh, negative crossing of the straight line. So, it is a it is responding for uh, the negative theta temperature. But when we make annealing, look at that, the data. So susceptibility just drops down very much. And it is not straight anymore. So what was the difference between one system and the other? System without any the as prepared sample, they might form some glass clusters, OK? When you make the annealing, the idea was those glass clusters just merge together at higher temperature treatment. They merge together, and then the system just shifts much more at behavior. So this kind of behavior we could not explain. You know, why? Why it shifts like this? It shifts very much in a certain range of temperature here and at low temperature. It shifts in two ranges, actually. It shifts from the straight line in this range and it shifts from the straight line in this range. There are two different ranges where temperature ranges where the system shifts out from paramagnetism. We don't know how. <laughs> we could not explain yet. So as I said, we are repeating this experiment, uh, pushing the doping a little farther and try to explain this. And also, we are going to make you know, uh, the annealing, not only 
in one sample. We did exactly in this sample. But we want to make a million of all the samples. They may be at different temperatures too. Okay. So, uh, so far I talk about mostly paramagnetic systems. Hmm? So those ones we expect to follow the Kihi uh, law or Kihi bias law. Hmm? Like, you know, doping typically. But now I want to talk a little bit about magnetic nanoparticles. So those who are really magnetic. So far, I showed you cerium oxide, which is not magnetic. It is diamagnetic. It was doped. And also tin oxide, uh, which, are not, which is not magnetic. It's diamagnetic too. Less than cerium oxide, but also uh, diamagnetic. And we doped that too, with chromium and iron. OK. Now it's different. Now we want to talk about magnet nanoparticles. So those which are really magnetic. And maybe when you shrink in the size of those particles, they come from uh, magnetically ordered, like ferromagnetic or ferrimagnet or antiferromagnet. They come down to so small that uh, there is no more translational symmetry available to the system. Uh, and the magnetic moments of it, the magnetic spin of each ion inside, they align together along the easy axis. But it can this magnetic moment is thermally excited. So it can move away from the direction of easy access. It can flip over, for instance. This is called super paramagnetic. So those are magnet nanoparticles, typically super paramagnetic. Now, <clears throat> we can explore, again, uh, the AC behavior of this system. AC susceptibility, for instance. Okay. Now, to do it, you can formulate the system like this. You apply an external field, which is AC field, and then your magnetization responds like this. And then you can see here, that's the susceptibility components, the real and imaginary components. You can extract this. You have a typical relaxation time. See, how you measure relaxation time in those systems? You measure like this, typically. You apply an external field, stead field, and then you can measure the magnetization. High. Field is high, and then you measure the magnetization. And then you switch off the field as quick as possible. It is not easy. It's a very difficult technical problem. But when you switch off, so the magnetic moments just starts to get randomly. And then the magnetization just drops down. Typical time for dropping down. And this time we call relaxation time. So this is a typical experiment. Clean up IBM. OK. You do this experiment like this. You measure magnetization as a function of time. You apply a strong field, and then the magnetization is high. And then switch off the field. There is a transient time here. You throw those data away. No problem. OK? Then your data will follow something like this. Hmm? You can take the half-life. That's relaxation time. Okay? The time that the system takes to goes down to half, 50%. So you can fit this curve and extract the relaxation time. 
So, relaxation time, you can model relaxation time using different, you know, uh, there are different models for relaxation time of the magnetic moment. If your nanoparticle is suspended in a liquid, the relaxation time is related to how fast the particle just turns around, turns inside the liquid. But if your nanoparticle is inside a solid matrix, huh, or is a powder, then the particle itself does not rotate. But the magnetic moment, it flips, it, it can deviate. So, those two processes are completely different. The time scale is completely different from the two processes. One relaxation is relaxation of the magnetic moment with respect to the easy x. We call this Neo, oh, Neo relaxation time. The other one is the relaxation time of the particle itself, you know, turning, turning, rotating. This is the Brownian relaxation time. The frequency are completely different, different. Orders of magnitude different. But when this comes together, the final, the effective relaxation time is a combination of the two. Okay? You have to keep this in mind. The Brownian and Neo relaxation. So, Neo relaxation time, the time scale is nanoseconds. And Brownian relaxation is microseconds. So, they are far apart in three orders of magnitude. But, they come together at the same time. If you, let, if you have a liquid in which you have magnet nanoparticles suspended in the liquid. This liquid is called magnetic fluid. So, both relaxation process takes place at the same time. And then, you need to write the effective relaxation time. How you write the effective relaxation time? You write it like this. I'm not sure if there is in the slide. So, the effective relaxation time will be like this. One of the effective is equal to 1 over the Neo plus 1 over the Brownian. This is the effective relaxation time. When the two processes are binding together. Okay. Now, here is the standard. This is quite standard. Oh, that's the effective. I'm sorry. It is over there. So the Brownian relaxation time is very simple. See? The Brownian relaxation time depends on viscosity of the medium. Eta is a viscosity. So the particle is inside the liquid, and the liquid has its viscosity. That is the viscosity. And it depends on the hydrodynamic volume of the particle. Remember, hydrodynamic volume is not the same as the physical Physical volume is that one you take from the TEM. And physical volume is not the same as the magnetic volume. Because the magnetic volume is the volume where you have magnetic ordering. If you have a core shell system, the shell is not very much magnetic, which is typical. So then the magnetic volume is smaller, usually is smaller than the physical volume you take from TEM. And the hydrodynamic volume is the biggest one. Because it's the volume of the particle moving in the fluid. But when you drop one nanoparticle in a fluid, the nanoparticle is not ball. It has hairs. Hmm? The hairs are the molecules that bind at the surface of the nanoparticle. So, 
where the particle rotates inside the air goes along. The hydrodynamic volume takes into account the hairs too. So it's bigger. Okay? So that's why here is the hydrodynamic volume and KT, you know, thermal. Okay. This is very simple. Uh, Neo relaxation time is exponential. Look at that. So uh, it is this typical relaxation time here is nanosecond. Okay? Now you have the exponential here. K is the anisotropy and V is the volume of the nanoparticle. Which volume? The magnetic volume, not the physical volume. Now, <clears throat> these two systems are, you know, these two relaxation processes are three orders of magnitude different. But you have to take into account both of them like this, the effective relaxation time. Also, another point, important point to consider is that nanoparticles, they are not at the same size. They are not monodispersed, they are polydispersed. And then you need to take into account the polydispersity because the properties depend on the size. And in many cases, depend strongly on the size. And then the typical polydispersion curve is a log normal. You can model the log normal in terms of the diameter, or you can model in terms of the volume, which is different. OK, and then any property you can express the average taking into account the particle size polydispersity, any property of the system, you have to take into account. OK, now, <clears throat> uh, we can uh, evaluate the frequency dependence of the susceptibility. So here is the frequency dependence of the imaginary component of susceptibility. So it changes very much if you change the relaxation time. This is the difference. So your system can play between Brownian and relaxation time. So the response is quite sensitive to the contribution of Brownian and Neo. You can run from a one frequency here to the other one, one end to the other one, three orders of magnitude. This you can see experimentally. Okay? In one system, the lower frequency is dominated by the Brownian. The higher frequency is dominated by Neo relaxation time. Okay? We can make this in a liquid. We just increase the viscosity of the liquid. It is a way to increase viscosity. Uh, for instance, you know glycerol. You know glycerol? Glycerol is a liquid, this viscous liquid. Okay? And glycerol you can mix with water uh, in any proportion. You know why? Because glycerol. You can change viscosity, uh, orders of magnitude, because glycerol is very polar molecule. It mixes with water very, very well. Why? Because glycerol is this molecule. It has three hydroxyl groups. And then it mixes with water in any proportion. But this viscosity here is much higher than the viscosity of water. Hmm? You can play this. Viscosity here is much higher. So you can suspend your nanoparticles in a mix of water and glycerol. Huh? Oh, also, there are many systems you can play, of course. 
many systems you can play. It doesn't mean it needs to be only two phases, could be more. Okay? But you can mix liquids with different viscosity, and then you can play between a system which is dominated by Brownian relaxation up to neo relaxation. And also, one thing you can do, you can cool down a little bit your sample, and then the viscosity goes very high. It goes to a point where the particle cannot turn around anymore. Okay. And then you can check how important the relaxation time is between a neo relaxation. Okay, now here are some data. You can see this is a typical uh, AC measurements. So is the imaginary component as a as, as a function of frequency. So then at different, these are different samples, different size of the samples. And you can see here from the data that the green one are the samples with 14 nanometer in size. The red one is at 10 nanometers in size. So as you reduce the size, this peak shifts to higher frequency. This is reasonable. You know why? Because, see, the magnetic moment is trying to follow the AC field. If the particle is small, the magnetic moment can move freely more than the particle, bigger particle. So it will respond in maximum at higher frequency. That's why this peak is shifted from lower frequency to higher frequency. The smaller the particle, the more the peak shifts to higher. Okay. Now we can extract this maximum of the peak and plot this as a function of the frequency. Okay? So we can explore this actually. Okay. Now okay. Let me, yesterday I showed you this system. Hmm? I joke that we made a small core of gold because we're not rich enough. <laughs> so we also, besides the data I showed you yesterday, we also explore AC susceptibility in this system. Let me show you. Remember, this is a, uh, the shell is magnetized. Hmm? Okay, here is the susceptibility. So that's the, you know, the, again, uh, a measure of susceptibility in different frequencies. We went from 15 hertz to 10 kilohertz. And you can see, you know, the, the peak of the maximum just shifts towards higher temperature. Okay, now we can model this taking the peak frequency or the relaxation time as a function of heat. So this is a typical behavior from near relaxation time. Okay, so you take the near relaxation time, you take the logarithm of this side, and then you can plot, you can make a plot like this, okay? Typical plot. So log of T versus inverse of temperature, okay? It's not a difficult algebra to get there. So it goes in a straight line. And from this straight line, we can extract the effective anisotropy. Remember, this energy barrier is K times V. OK? K times V. And the magnetic system here is not the whole particle, but the shell. Hmm? We are probing not the gold. We are probing the magnetite shell. So this is a behavior of the magnetite shell, actually. So the magnetite shell responds to like a Neel system. Very much, <coughs> you see a straight line here. And the relaxation, the typical relaxation time is about the range. I mentioned to you minutes ago that tau naught is around 
uh, nano picosecond, between nano and picosecond. And it is exactly in the range. OK. So, and then we can extract the book. We can extract the effective, effective uh, anisotropic constant from the shell. The shell is magnetized. We identify using X-ray, using high resolution TEM. So we identify the shell as magnetite phase. And then you can compare the, 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 the uh, anisotropic constant here. We extract from the data with anisotropic constant of bulk magnetite. So bulk magnetite has anisotropic constant in this range. Hmm? And we found exactly at the extreme, 1.3. That's the number we found. So it's amazing why typically, this is a very interesting point, typically the anisotropic constant of nanomaterials is, very, is smaller than the anisotropic constant of the book phase. This is typical. But in this case, we found the layer, the anisotropic constant of that layer, the shell layer, is at the highest end of the bulk anisotropic constant of magnetite. So what is that? We have here a different system. So the system is not, is not a particle, is not a spherical or, or ellipsoidal or a disk, or a wire. No, it's a shell. Okay. Now, besides this, there is interface between the magnetite and the gold. So this interface, the interaction between these two phases, we claim that this interaction is the responsible to push up the anisotropic constant, close to the higher end of bulk magnetite. So also, you know, if you if you uh, if you change the strain, you also change the anisotropy constant. So we claim the change of the anisotropy constant came from the strain between the shell and the core. <coughs> okay. So here are again typical measurements uh, of imaginary component of susceptibility versus temperature. But in this case, we can extract the relaxation time and try to fit on NEO, on the NEO expression, like before, like the previous slide. But in this case, this is magnetite. But a full particle, nanoparticle of magnetite is not a shell magnetite. In this case, it doesn't fit the NEO relaxation time. It doesn't fit this model as we did before. But this is a well-known phenomenon. So, expression uh, proposed by NEO in nine. This is a very interesting point because people start talking about nano in, you know, not long ago, 20 years ago. And superparamagnetism, which is typically nanomagnetism, was first proposed by Neil in 1949. So nanomagnetism is very old. Older than me. And I feel myself old. Okay. Now, this is one proposal from 1949, actually. But then people, those guys, Vogel and Fulker, they propose a change on this expression. Just taking not only T, but T minus a typical temperature. Okay? So, if you see here, that's the only change. They shift, you know, they propose a change like this one. 
But of course, if you multiply here K times this typical temperature, this is energy. What that means? It means that they claim, when they propose this expression, they claim that it can describe the interaction between particle and particle. So, particle-particle interaction changes the relaxation time. Well, it's not hard to believe about that. Hmm? So they propose this expression to measure the energy of this particle-particle interaction. The energy of particle-particle interaction is exactly K times this typical temperature. This gives you an idea of how strong two or more nanoparticles interact to each other. So, if you do the fitting with this expression, you, you have a good fitting, like that one. But if you do the fitting with near relaxation, it doesn't fit. It may fit, actually, but the numbers you extract from is very far from the numbers you should expect. For instance, you may find the typical relaxation time, you fit, if you fit this data with this curve, you find the typical relaxation time like 10 to minus 20 seconds. No, impossible. Completely off. But if you fit the data with this expression, then you find typical relaxation time in the range of nano and picoseconds, which is the right range. So, it is not, if you look at the fitting, the fitting might be fine, but the data you extract, maybe there is no meaning of the, those data. You have to check this point too, okay? Now, <coughs> wow, okay. Let me, maybe this is the last one. Let me talk to you about another system we produce. So, make some polymer uh, with pores. They are meso porous polymer. So, those are polymers, spheres, about around 200 microns diameter, very much spherical, but they are pores. And then we took those polymer and sink inside, inside sulfate solution. Iron 2, okay? So the iron 2 just enters this polymer, okay? But this polymer was treated with a sulfonic acid or sulfuric acid. And then inside the polymer, we have sulfonic uh, <coughs> groups inside. So when you sink it inside iron sulfate solution, the ion ions go inside and bind to these functional groups. Okay? And then we take that one and drop inside strong bases like sodium hydroxide. So the hydroxyl group just, you know, <coughs> enters the template quickly, diffuses quickly into the template and replace the iron, just <coughs> oxidize this iron to magnetite quickly. And you can play this with different concentrations of iron. The higher the concentration of iron inside, the more magnetite you get inside. So magnetite nanoparticles, they are synthesized inside those mesopores. Hmm? It's a nano cavity synthesis process, actually. Okay? <coughs> and of course, the size of magnetite cannot be bigger than the size of the pores. It's a way to control the growth, actually. Okay? And you can modulate the size of the pores when you do the synthesis of this polymer. It's a copolymer, actually. Estyrene divinyl benzene. This is the polymer. Okay, now we, we did the same. We measured susceptibility here. 
we measure imaginary and real components of susceptibility as a function of T. <coughs> and we can change the content of magnetite inside, making many cycles of precipitation of magnetite and also playing with the concentration of the iron. So we can play with these two parameters. And you can load your polymer with more or less magnetite. So here are two samples. This one, the concentration was 10 millimole of iron, the same as here. But this one, we made three cycles of precipitation. And this one, we made six cycles of precipitation. You can do this one time, two times, three times, etc. OK. Now, what we can extract from this data. So we made a plot, the typical plot, the vogel fulker plot. And then we can extract from these two plots different constants, different especially the T0. The interaction between particle and particle, the energy interaction between the particle. Let me see if I drop it there. Oh, no. So, we found in this uh, work that as we increase the concentration of magnetite inside, the parameters we can extract from the fitting of the susceptibility measurements, which is K times T zero as the number of particles increase, which means the particles are now closer together and they can interact strongly. So it was the expected result. So here is how it looks. So that's the, ma the, the mass. The, this is mass. This is the mass included in the polymer as a function of the concentration of iron and for different cycles of precipitation. Hmm? <clears throat> this is a typical uh, protocol that allows you to control the amount of magnetite you can include in this. OK, so we did also. This is a measurement with the Robinson oscillator. But here, see, this is the frequency versus this is the susceptibility versus frequency. And then we took those peaks and changed the field, the applied field, the DC field. So the data goes like this. And we think we can understand. So this is the experiment we did from, with those samples, actually, with these samples. Okay. Now we understand the data how it fits, how the peak position shifts with the DC field applied. So this is, was also a PhD thesis of one of my students. And we modeled this. We developed a model for this. So we took the frequency like the NEL, NEL relaxation time proposed by NEL in 1949, which, is, which fits well with a double potential well like this, symmetrical potential well, which means the magnetic moment of the particle is aligned along the easy axis, but it can go flip 100, 180 degrees. OK? But this potential well is just, this potential well is symmetrical. But we apply an external field. When you apply an external field, this guy is not symmetrical anymore. It's asymmetric potential well. You have to take into account this symmetry to fit your data. So we propose a correction of this relaxation time, taking into account the field, so the energy. <coughs> and then <coughs> this is the energy. And the energy is, it depends on the magnetic moment times h, which is the field. And then we model this energy. So there is a distribution function for this energy. Because the magnetic moment of the particle, the particle is not all the same size. 
they are poorly dispersed. So they have a difference in magnet moment. We need to take this into account. So at the end, we can calculate the average. And the average goes with this expression. And this is the expression that fits the data, fits nicely. OK, this is another way to extract information from susceptibility measurements. <coughs> Applying external field is not very usual, because people usually do AC measurements at zero external field. They just change the frequency. But here, we want to include the external field. OK, this is another system we, we produce there. So nanoparticles, they are uh, surface decorated with different molecules. Hmm? So we also measure, measure, we take also the measurement of, of, of uh, dy we, saw, we call dynamical susceptibility, and measure the uh, uh, imaginary component as a function of frequency, extract the peak positions, and measure as a function of field. So we use the same model as last slide to fit this data. <clears throat> and I think I run more than one hour. OK, so I, I really appreciate your patience with me. And it is exactly it is time for a break. And we should be back here at 2 PM. OK, thank you. The, the next one is one hour. Yeah. 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 Okay, so if you have some questions, please. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it depends on, uh, you mean, a standard VSM that measures exactly magnetization. Uh, to extract what? Anisotropy. Magnetic anisotropy. You can try to fit the data, Sir. OK? But uh, from hysteresis loop, can we get any idea? Yeah, you can, you can try, because actually uh, the anisotropy is included in the expression of the magnetization. So it is possible to measure that. <laughs> Some curve to that and yeah, it is possible to extract, but it is an indirect way to extract the data. Direct one is that, switch off the magnetic field and then find out how much time it is taking. And, and from that relaxation time, figure out the case. Well, the way you can measure in a standard VSM, so what the standard VSM gives you, it gives you, first, is a DC system, right? It gives you the magnetization only, OK? So from the magnetization curve, if you fit that curve, like for instance, uh, <coughs> see, if you are measuring uh, magnetization in a VSM system, if you are measuring magnetization of super paramagnetic particles, the data you collect, so the data is like this, typically. OK? So this data you can fit well with a first order Langevin function which goes with the hyperbolic tangent of kv over kt minus kt over kv. OK? Here is your question. So from this data, if you fit this data, you can extract the anisotropy constant. But you need to know about this one. OK? So how do you know about this one? Make TEM. OK? Then you can include here the average 
size. Is it uh, physical volume or magnetic volume? What this is magnetic volume. Magnetic. Magnetic volume. Pm will give that. Well, magnetic volume is close to physical volume. Okay, so you can check. You can check. You can double check this volume. Doing at the same time TEM and X ray diffraction. Okay? So, the, from the X ray diffraction doing Whitfield refinement, you can extract the size, the volume. If that volume is close to this one, it means the shell layer is very thin. So, basically, the physical volume will be the magnetic volume. It's a way to check this. But in principle, your question is, can we extract anisotropy from standard VSM? Yes, you can. But it's indirect way to measure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there any other question? Hello. Uh, G, uh, G, sir, sir, suppose uh, sir, we talk about the uh, nil relaxation time. Suppose in the absence of uh, magnetic field, uh, nil relaxation time is much than the time to measure the magnetization of the nanoparticle. Then what we can think about the magnetization of that sample or not? Uh, let me see if I understood your question. Uh, actually, uh, uh, in absence of field, if nil uh, relaxation time is much than the time measured to magnetization okay. of the nanoparticle, then after this we can think about the average magnetization of that sample or not? It could be. Yeah, it could be, but not necessarily. I mean, it depends on also the particle-particle interaction. Okay? So, you have to and sometimes the particle-particle interaction is so strong that it shifts a lot the relaxation time. It does. It does shift a lot. There are systems which are strongly coupled. So, but it could be. If the coupled, then it will be. Thank you, sir. Okay, if not, I will invite you to go for lunch. Thank you. <laughs>